De koning van de Ashanti, zijn majesteit Otomfo Osei Tutu II, heeft een lezing gehouden op de Antonokom Universiteit van Suriname. De lezing is getiteld The Role of a Traditional Paramount King in a Contemporary Modern Nation State. Bij deze lezing heeft centraal gestaan de rol van de traditionele koning in een moderne staat. His Majesty, all the of the delegation also, our delegation, the Council of Ministers, and university members. Let me just say that it is an honor to have you here, His Majesty. We have had a very, we have had very fruitful meetings the past two days from since you're coming here. And I must say that we have certain challenges that we see common for Suriname and Ghana. In our education system, of course, through our, in the government also, we try to see and to strive for a certain excellence in government. The same is for education. Right now, we have a lot of challenges. We will see in the tertiary education to make this legislation. We will also involve the university. And as former Minister of Education, Science, and Culture, I know that the cultural aspect is very near to our heart here in Suriname. We call it in a unity or diversity aspect that we all see. And of course, through the university, we can talk about cultural anthropology, but also in what we excel. If we say we have an excellent and we want excellence in education, university can be a catalyzer to help us what we know, what we are now um, uh, initiating, and that is the traditional medicine. What we see, since we are a part of the Amazon basin, we see a lot of medical herbs medicinal herbs being used by our custodians of knowledge. So we see the university as bridging the scholar to the custodians of knowledge in that we can hold on to the knowledge that is there, utilize it in patents, but also that we protect the custodians of knowledge so that in their own community again they can go forth and prosper on the same basis. I know that the challenges that we have in common today we have seen the university propose a chair. That's the first step. We congratulate the university on the proposition. We hope that the broadness of this chair will enable us to include in that the medicinal factor. The fact that we have common knowledge and heritage. I know the king has a great pro proposition on heritage tourism. It's a new concept for us. We know it's cultural tourism, medical tourism, but it's heritage tourism we are very interested in. We hope that university will pick that up and see how we can utilize all the knowledge all the culture that is with His Excellency and the Ashanti Kingdom and of course Ghana and see how we can work towards a future in common strife and endeavor. I thank you. Thank you, Vice President. The special meaning of today is a lecture. So may I now invite His Majesty, the King Otumfo Osei Tutu II, Asantehene for the public lecture. And that it is entitled, The Role of a Traditional Paramount King in a Contemporary Modern Nation State. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Ministers of State here present, sure. uh, the board members of the university here present, <coughs> let me say at the outset how thankful we are to the authorities of the university for giving me the opportunity to interact with you. Sure. My delegation is equally grateful for the warm reception accorded us since our arrival on the university campus. Sure. And just a few moments ago, the, the gifts that I've been given, uh, in fact, uh, it will find a, a pride of place in the palace when I, when I take them to remind me. Sure. And, uh, and also that uh, amongst my delegation, I have the chairman of the university council, uh, who also happens to be one of my paramount chiefs, 
and uh, a former diplomat. And I will charge him to take up the challenge that the board members have, have given so that the chair and the collaboration between the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and the, the Anton de Com University uh, would then be cemented. So I charge you to do that. Before we leave, please have, uh, take it up with them and know the modalities that we can do there. Sure. I deem it a special privilege and a great honor to have been given the chance to deliver a lecture at this country's only tertiary institution, more so an institution named after a well-known Surinamese patriot and resistance fighter, Anton de Combe, who lost his life in a Nazi concentration camp in the Netherlands in 1945. Sure. It is with great joy that I bring you warm greetings and felicitations from my president and the government and people of Ghana, your kith and kin on the other side of the Atlantic as you approach the celebration of the 43rd anniversary of your country's deliberation from liberation from Dutch colonial rule. It is my considered view that the organizers of today's lecture could not have come up with a better topic given the time and place of the lecture. The topic, the role of a traditional keel in a contemporary nation state raises several issues and compels us to look at Africa's pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial periods. It revives the raging debate on the relevance of traditional governance systems vis-a-vis -vis the imported and imposed Western democratic systems and the relevance of traditional leadership in the current democratic dispensation in a modern nation state. So, in pre-colonial Africa, for want of better classification, two types of societies prevailed, the centralized states and the acephalo states. The centralized society denotes a state that had a recognized central authority who owed allegiance to the government. Political authority resided with a centralized authority who could be a king, chief, a monarch, for example, the Zulu in South Africa, Dahomey in present-day Benin, Oyo in Nigeria, Uganda in Uganda and my own Asante in Ghana. So, the acephalous societies, sometimes pejoratively called stateless societies, had no centralized political authority. Examples of the latter are the Tiv and Igbo in Nigeria, the Maasai in Tanzania and Kenya, and the Talensi and Kokomba in Ghana. So, it is misleading for anyone to contend or assume that traditional African leadership was never without control or accountability. So, These societies were democratic in nature. There were checks and balances. While the king appeared very powerful generally from outside, he was nonetheless subject to very strict control. So, Not only by means of taboos, but, but from institutions and personalities of very high moral authority, authorities and integrity whose main preoccupation was protecting and safeguarding the kingdom. So, Indeed, the well-organized nature of the indigenous governance of, of system in, in places like Buganda and Asante compelled the British to introduce a system of indirect rule, a system of colonial administration by which the British ruled through the local chiefs. Indirect rule was first used by the British in Buganda developed in northern Nigeria and later extended to the Gold Coast and other colonies in Africa. So, Chief Tansi is one of the most highly cherished of our traditional institutions. Its existence still represents our indigenous system of government as it has existed throughout the centuries. It was in existence in various forms before our first con contact with Europeans in the 15th century and has survived without a break right up until the present. So, in pre-colonial times, chiefs played multifaceted roles and were the fulcrum around which the whole society revolved. So, chiefs were spiritual and religious leaders, judges, legislators, military leaders, all rolled into one. In modern governance system, or in, in modern governance parlance, it can be said that chiefs 
were the heads of all the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judiciary. So, the traditional Ghanaian chief emerged as a natural leader. He was essentially the founder and therefore the father of the traditional state over which he presided. So, An important role of the king was to lead his people to war to defend, protect, and extend their territories. So, Indeed, it was in fulfillment of this obligation that Ashanti kings waged several wars that led to the growth and establishment of an empire that became the largest, the most recognized, and one of the most well-known in Africa as a whole. So, the distinction between the roles of kings before, during, and after, after colonialism is important. Indeed, colonialism tipped the scale of autocracy and democracy in favor of the king. So, the democratic aspect of traditional leadership was weakened by the colonialists who introduced pure di dictatorships without checks and balances in Africa. So, the post-colonial period was no better as many post-independent governments saw chiefs as a countervailing power and as impediments to modernization and nation building and tried to curtail their role in politics. So, despite those attempts, chieftaincy has shown its resilience and survived. Since the 1990s, a large number of African countries have enhanced and formalized the position of their chiefs. For example, powerful kingdoms of Buganda abolished so, in Uganda's 1967 constitution after the Buganda king had been exiled in 1966, was restored to a certain extent by President Museveni. In 1995, the constitution was withdrawn to recognize the institute of traditional rulers in Uganda. In Ghana, the 1992 constitution guaranteed the institution of ch chieftaincy together with its traditional councils as established by customary law and usage. Article 270, Section 1, and Article 270, Section 2, stipulates that Parliament cannot interfere in the process of recognition of chiefs, an abhorrent practice that in the past was used by politicians to undermine the institution. So, this power lies exclusively with the traditional councils and houses, houses of chiefs, with a final appeal to the Supreme Court. The regional houses of chiefs, each of them, each of the ten regions has one, furthermore act as advisory bodies to the state, discuss traditional social practices, and give official recognition to chiefs. So, Truth be told, chiefs have remained of much greater importance in Ghana than elsewhere in West Africa. Indeed, traditional leadership position is becoming more competitive than ever before and is attracting academics, civil servants, business leaders, and others from all walks of life. In the Asante Kingdom, chiefs are highly visible and organized. So, we have always had chiefs with, at different levels in Ghanaian society, elected in accordance with the customs and traditions of their respective communities. In the Asante Kingdom, at the apex of the traditional hierarchy is the king. Below him is the paramount chief, then divisional chiefs. Then at the lowest level is the village chief, Odikro. So, there are 70 paramount chiefs in, the, in Asante and Braha for regions alone. So, there are also satellite paramounts in the Volta and Eastern region who all come under my traditional jur jurisdiction as the occupant of the Golden Stool. So, as the incumbent of the Golden Stool, I am the embodiment of the soul and unity of the Ashanti nation. So, at one time, the Ashanti Empire extended from parts of modern Cote d'Ivoire in the west to parts of present-day Togo in the east, and from the Atlantic coast in the south to an indeterminate area in the north. Indeed, at the zenith of his power in the 19th century, the Asante Kingdom covered more than 70% of modern Ghana, so, and its influence extended beyond the frontiers of the country. Today, the Asante Kingdom remains as one of the most recognized and vibrant traditional kingdoms in Ghana and the world. So, Currently, the kingdom covers an area of 
of 24,389 kilometers, square kilometers, which is about 10.2% of the total land mass of Ghana. So, like Suriname, Shanti region has huge reserves of rainforest, which can support different types of farming as ecotourism and the lumber and logging industry. So, Moreover, a very large percentage of Ghana's premium cocoa used in the manufacturing of cocoa worldwide is from there. Shanti also has rich gold mines in addition to huge deposits of bauxite, which unlike yours is yet to be mined. Above all, we have a well-educated youth that can be used to support any development programs and projects. Sure. Geographically, the Asante Kingdom is located in the center of modern Ghana, making it the natural gateway to the other regions in the country. The relevant question at this juncture is whether the emergence of Ghana as a nation state has affected my role as a king or a traditional ruler. While recognizing the importance of living in a nation or state, I submit that this has not prevented me from playing my role as a king. So, the nation state is defined as one where the great majority are conscious of a common identity and share the same culture. So, the, the ideal of nation state incorporates people of a single stock and cultural traditions. So, however, so, most contemporary states are polyethnic. The history of Africa clearly shows that most states on the continent were artificial contraptions tailored by the metropolitan powers during the 1884-1885 Berlin Conference to suit their commercial and economic interests without any consideration of common ethnic identities. So, Ghana's current borders were established by the 1900s as the British Gold Coast. It became independence on the 6th of March 1957, the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to throw off the colonial yoke. So, the country has over 100 ethnic groups spread across the country. It is pertinent to point out that chief exist in one form or another in all the 10 regions of the country, making the institution one of the dis distinguishing features of Ghana. So, we live in modern times and in a, in a modern nation state of ethnic groups. It is imperative we, we take advantage of the chieftaincy institution to align with the needs and interests of our respective communities. Chiefs have always been agents of development. In this regard, I recall that the Nkoswa Development Tool was created in 1985 by my immediate pre predecessor and brother, Otunfo Opokwari II, to promote development. This has caught on and has been emulated by chiefs in all the regions. So, the nature of warfare in contemporary lines has changed. The enemy is not ethnic group, it's not another ethnic group, rather poverty, hunger, disease, squalor, literacy and crime, injustice, environmental degradation, depletion of resources, greed, ignorance and conflicts. These are the challenges of the 21st century conf confronting mankind as a whole. It was with a view to addressing these challenges that the United Nations, in its collective wisdom, adopted the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, at the dawn of the new millennium. So, it was to cons consolidate the gains made in these areas that the successor regime of Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by the same organization in 2015. So, since my ascension to the Golden Stool as the King of Asante Kingdom some 19 years ago, it should be 20 in April. So, it has long dawned on me that it would be unrealistic to expect government alone, with its finite and limited resources and time limits, to be able to confront these multifaceted and mon monumental challenges. With the passage of time, I have become more convinced that traditional authorities need to work together and act in partnership with government, civil society organizations, and the private sector if we expect to be successful in tackling the developmental challenges in the broad areas of peace and security, human rights, rule of law, and sustainable development. So, it was in recognition of the socioeconomic realities facing our communities that as keen I have taken some initiatives in some, in some of these areas. 
I set up the Otum for Education Fund to generate resources to provide opportunities for quality primary, secondary, tertiary, and vocational education. Sure. Not only in Ashanti, but Ghana generally. To date, over 20,000 students, pupils at various levels of education have benefited from the fund. Sure. Additionally, I set up a teacher's award scheme to encourage teachers to focus on teaching our awards very well. Sure. I later set up the Sewan Pim AIDS Foundation to, uh, for children under the leadership of my spouse, Lady Julia Osei to help children who have become victims of HIV AIDS pandemic. Sure. These two new bodies have now been combined under the umbrella of the Otum Force H2 Charity Foundation and included among its priority areas health, water, and sanitation and, and culture. Ghana is a multi-ethnic society. Sure. My kingdom, located at the center of the country, has become multi-ethnic, multicultural, and cosmopolitan. As king, I have always preached ethnic harmony it is of cardinal importance we do away with negative ethnicity and foster ethnic harmony. We should not abhor adversity. There is strength in diversity. There is beauty in diversity. Sure. It behoves every stakeholder in our society not to encourage vociferous tendencies that would either pose an existential threat to the territorial integrity and unity of the country or undermine peace and security generally. Sure. Perhaps it was in appreciation of my unique leadership role that the government of Ghana appointed me chairman of the committee of eminent chiefs to resolve the Yendi skin affairs which had earlier destabilized a section of our community in the northern part of our country. Sure. Although the conflict is not fully resolved, I, I finished uh, virtually resolving that last Wednesday before I boarded the plane to come here on Thursday anyway. <laughs> Sure. Relative, claim has re relative calm has returned to the area. It can be inferred from the above that as a traditional leader, my revered position and influence can be used in diverse ways to complement the efforts of others to promote the welfare of our citizens for which we as leaders have primary responsibility. Sure. We are and have always been agents of development. We should continue to use our position to galvanize and mobilize our people to initiate and execute development projects like markets, community health facilities, police stations, while present government or seeking external investments to undertake heavy or capital intensive projects for which we may lack the requisite resources. So, it was indeed in pursuit of such a strategy that on my own initiative, I secured a World Bank grant for a pilot project entitled, entitled Promoting Partnership with Traditional Authorities Project. Sure. Under the project, new school buildings, including teachers' quarters, have been put up with facilities for portable water and electricity supply. Sure. As keen in discharging my judicial functions through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms in my traditional course, I can contribute and have indeed contributed to reducing the workload of the judiciary, while at the same time promoting peace and security, which are indispensable ingredients for development. Sure. I recall that early in my reign, I got all chief tenancy cases in court withdrawn to be dealt with in my traditional courts. Sure. When cases are satisfactorily settled, the parties do not find their way to court, thereby reducing the workload of the judiciary. Sure. Thus, traditional courts have served and continue to be used as a formal machinery for maintaining law and order. In view of, of the unique position of chiefs in our society, we have always been interlocutors or, or links between our communities and government. It is part of our responsibility as chiefs to ensure that information about government policies is disseminated to the people throughout the kingdom or our respective communities. So, Communication is a two-way process. Information should not trickle down but also bubble up. We can and do help to transmit the feelings, opinions of, or grievances of our people either to government or to whoever the appropriate authority may be. Sure. Finally, one role of a king which has not changed much is my role as the fount of honor, which confers on me the power to bestow honors on deserving citizens as a reward for bravery or distinguished service to the community. 
So, it was in consonance with this tradition that in 2002 I conferred the noble title of Busumru, son of the Golden Stool and Excellency Kofiana and former United Nations General Secretary, a reverend compatriot and global icon, so, in rec recognition of his dis distinguished service to peace and humanity. So, it is difficult to look into a crystal ball and predict the outcome of the evolution of any human institution with absolute certainty. But on the basis of my knowledge of the Chieftaincy Institution and of Ashanti, my beloved Ashanti Kingdom, I am confident that there will be more and better cooperation between our traditional leaders and government for the benefit of our people. So, it is an incontrovertible fact that a chief, especially a prominent one, is a political and social power center, even if in a circumscribed sense, in the area he rules an ipso facto, a microcosm of authority. He sometimes rivals central government part in legitimacy, recognition, and loyalty. The power of the politician can be temporary because he suffers term limits. So, whilst the chief has no such limitation, and unless he violates his oath of office, may be there until he, di he dies. So, whatever tension exists between our traditional governance system and the modern system of government will need to be resolved. In my view, the best way found will be to have a fusion of the best of both worlds, the salient and time-tested positive elements in our traditional government, governance regime should be combined with the positive aspects of the Western democratic system. So, the Chieftain's institution is fluid and dynamic. It is refreshing that our indigenous governance system is reshaping itself to complement the development role of the state. So, in fact, Chieftaincy implies development, and any occupant of a traditional stool is just on, on the tangible and, and intangible resources that he can bring to the community through his position. So, Chiefs have emerged as legit, legitimate interlocutors of the central government on behalf of their communities and their development aspirations. So, as a traditional ruler in a multi-ethnic nation state, it is part of my ambition and commitment to search for trade investment and partnerships for my kingdom and country. So, I foresee several ways in which Ghana, Ashanti, and Suriname can do business for their mutual benefit. The abundant natural resources in both countries have put both countries on the global map for trade, investment, and partnership opportunities. So, there are other geographic features enhancing our desires to be partners in commerce. Ghana is the, at the center of West Africa, and is therefore the natural gateway to over 250 million strong ECOWAS markets. So, Suriname sits on the major sea and air transport route connecting South and North America. Paramaribo is the closest South American capital to Europe and Africa. We can, we can and must work together in the supreme interest of our people. And I thank you for your attention. So,